ladies and gentlemen. Great. Moving on to our uh, second panel discussion, which is part two of how chefs are changing the course. So this is again led by uh, the chairman of our World Chefs Feed the Planet Committee. And welcoming back on stage, Chris, I'll let you do your bit with your panel. He's doing a quick head count. We've, we're missing two. They'll turn up. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the stage, Chris Kotke. <laughs> Done. Thank you. Okay, welcome to, uh, to part two, everybody. In interest of time, we're going to get this going right away. Um, so this is how chefs are changing the course. So we've heard about a little bit earlier sort of some of the big why questions. And we were challenged to move from baby steps to adult steps and all of that that you heard. In the presentation you just heard, some real, really key things there, right? What are the kitchen KPIs? What does that mean moving forward and are we changing? Answering the question, what can we do? And it reminds me of Stavanger eight years ago. Eight years ago? Eight years ago when Julian Cribbs sat on the stage and challenged all of us chefs to think differently about sustainability. And he said, it is the wicked problem of our time, exactly what you saw in the last presentation. Lots of people needing more resources and not able to produce it. So what can we do about that? So to help understand that, we have a number of very, very competent panelists. Again, I encourage you to go and read all about them because each one is absolutely amazing. But let's bring them up on stage. Uh, Frank Full, we're smart chairman. Come on. <laughs> Come on, guys, wake up. <laughs> Frederic Bo, pastry explorer, Valrona. I really want that title for myself, that's cool. Uh, Christine Hartvigsen, president of Nordic Chef Association. <laughs> Woo! Uh, Anders Higa, did I get it right? Close enough. Close enough. President of the Danish Chef Association and part of the Nordic Board. And lastly, uh, Rainier Wieman, General Manager, Middle East and Africa of Upfield. Come on up. Have a seat at the very end. Okay. A couple quick announcements before we get going. Uh, the first is, when we're done in here and you're walking around the show over there, there is a really cool thing we put in there for all of you, and it's called the ICCA Studio. And what it is, it's right by the World Chef's Village, it's right by where you eat lunch, right there. It is a resource for every one of you, of you in this room to walk in there, and we can do a really short interview with you. We're going to record it, because we want to hear what you're doing on a sustainability standpoint, or maybe what you are committing to do. So please stop by. We want to hear from you, every one of you, chefs down to students and everything in the middle. So please stop by. I promise it'll be a whole lot of fun. Lastly, before we get going, you might see some people walking around with this. It says, feed the planet. These were lovingly made out of kitchen towels. Thank you, Ingrid. Uh, <laughs> it's really cool. Anyone with this on their, on their clothes, Stop them and ask them about what we're doing with Feed the Planet because they all work with us from Electrolux, from Isaac, et cetera. So we'll talk about that later on, please. And then lastly, to get things going, speaking of video, uh, are we ready to cue a video? Two thumbs up from Lynn. Let's cue it and then we're going to start our discussion. Grab a mic, everybody.
Andersen går til Danmark. Gratulerer! Andersen, den går til Island. Og førsteklassen i Nordic Green Chef, den går til Norge. Excellent. Thank you, Christine, for bringing us that video. And just so you're aware that in everything you just saw in that video, there was no meat in there whatsoever. So we're going to talk about that in a little bit. So we've, we've heard a lot about the whys, etc. This whole session with these panelists is about how. It's about looking to these people each for their examples to teach us to move us to action, as was, we talked about in the previous panel, if we just learn and don't do anything, this is an absolute waste of everybody's time. So it's about action. So I was going to ask you an icebreaker. Let's see if we can do it really fast, but you have to have like 30 second answers. Ready? And the question I asked each one of them ahead of time is, at what point in your professional career did you decide that sustainability was something you had to do? When was that? Because I'm hoping that for everybody in this room today, if you haven't committed, maybe today is the day that you say you have to do something different. Are we ready? You want, you want to start, Frank? Okay. All right, 30 <laughs> seconds. Go. So for me, uh, Chris, it was uh, 88 in Thailand. I uh, went there to do a Belgian promotion, and I saw a kitchen with a lot of vegetable, with vegetable in the center of the board. Uh, of the dish, and uh, I was so uh, shocked that in Belgium we did not do enough to put vegetable in the main course. And everything changes. Frederic, use that mic. And, uh, oops, sorry. Hey, sorry. <laughs> 17 years ago, I assisted to a Pierre Gagnier conference in uh, Equipe Hotel in Paris. And Pierre Gagnier was doing a wonderful conference in front of uh, 300 chefs. And he, he was speaking without never speaking about sustainability, about measured gourmandise. And Pierre Gagnier was uh, explaining to the chefs, if we are following this way, we're going to be the has-been chefs of the world. And we are coming from Auguste Escoffier. And it's funny because Wax was created by Auguste Escoffier. But if we are just following to cook on this way, we definitely will be the has-been chefs. We have to change our point of view to change off point of view. Great. And 16 years ago, it changed my mind. Christine. Yes, I um, understand it for 10 years ago when we arranged the Norway Green Chef and we do something and start to take action in the Nordic for five years ago. And this year, in the March, we had the Nordic Green Chef competition. Excellent. Anders? Well, it's uh, kind of silly, but <laughs> about 11 years ago, my daughter asked me a question in the kitchen. Why do we throw so much food in the bin? And I couldn't answer her. So that's my story. <laughs> this is fabulous. In here. Um, so two and a half years ago, I was asked to set up a plant-based business in the Middle East and uh, North Africa. And everybody said, no, that's not possible. Plant-based food in the Middle East, they're way behind Europe and the United States. And two and a half years later, we have a multi-million business here. We're growing significantly. We launched Vine Life uh, plant-based cheese in 11 markets, and it's, it's grown like crazy. So... I don't have a sustainability story like an inherently. I'm just following the business, and it's a huge opportunity. Yeah. It's, it's a story. We had another panelist who was going to join us, and, he, and he, he said to us, he said, I changed when my daughter looked at me and called me a planet killer. So He worked for Fonterra. <laughs> <laughs> so is today the day that you're going to make that commitment, all of you who haven't? Are you going to look back on today and say, I heard that panel, and this was the day I decided that I had to do something? Think about that. In the meantime, Frank, let's jump in. So you're the, 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 the vegetable restaurant guy. <laughs> Doesn't do you justice. But what are you seeing in terms of plant-based restaurants today? You, you go all over the world. You, you, you look at these. You find out who are the best ones in the world. 
what are the trends you're seeing? Uh, and then what can chefs who are non-vegetarian restaurants learn from the people that you're working with? So important is that they did all a big step eh, because it was not easy to go for 100% plant-based or even go for more plant-based. And uh, uh, that's something that you to need courage. Eh? And uh, everybody is afraid about it, about the economic uh, uh, thing about it. And, uh, but also uh, they need really, uh, when you do it, you have really to go and you have to communicate about it. And uh, so what can you learn? That gastronomy, high level cuisine can be plant-based that everything happens by the taste. We will not convince people when it is not good to eat more plant-based. So that is important and they are doing it. They are showing it to their clients, their guests, that they can eat without meat, without fish, uh, food that is even more better than before. And do, they, and do they fill their restaurants? I mean, how does that work for them? Are they popular? Do they make money? <laughs> The, 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 the restaurants, and we know uh, some of them are very good. Eh? They were in the media, uh, Eleven Madison in New York, uh, René Mathieu, uh, who is in uh, Luxembourg. Those restaurants, Emile van der Staak, who is in the Netherlands, those restaurants are fully booked for all year. Everybody wants to go there. Everybody wants to see what those chefs are doing. So uh, that is a good thing. So you don't have to be afraid anymore. All right, looks like it's a future trend. Frederic, um, let's talk the world of pastries because a lot of times in the sustainable dialogue that we have, pastries gets left out. You know, we hear about, you know, nose to tail, we, you know, all this stuff, but what, what's happening in the world of, of pastry? You've dedicated your life there. What's happening with pastry chefs, with pastry shops who are thinking and trying to be more sustainable? Definitely, we more speaking about sustainability, more about the sh uh, savory will. And today, we are not speaking really enough about sustainability, about the dessert. Um, many chefs, you are chefs mostly, they said uh, the cuisine is to eat and the pastry is for fun and pleasure. It's totally wrong way. You know I'm French, and France is the country of the pastry. It's um, always over generosity. The French pastry is uh, um, the country of the cream, of the butter. And I hate to hear still today in France, pastry is different. It's not to feed. Pastry is just for pleasure and emotion. Since eight years in the world, we are uh, dying by obesity in the uh, modern countries. And when I began to work 16 years ago about uh, a measured indulgence, uh, I was feeling to be totally alone. All my friends, chefs, they were looking at me as a crazy man. But I think it's uh, really, I'm, I'm leaving my job really as a responsibility, a, a real commitment. As Pierre Gagnier said 16 years ago, he said he finished his show in front of 300 chefs. Don't forget, ladies and gentlemen, if we have to give so many fun and emotion to our customer, we are also we are responsible about their wellness, their health. And I think we, we have today more, more than yesterday, we are ready to take care about the healthness, we can, I'm not a vegetable man, vegetarian man, but just by chance, I create so many recipes um, vegetarian. Uh, chocolate is vegetable, you know? Thanks it's only it. vegetable, <laughs> you know? Cocoa beans, sugar, and beetroot, and cocoa beans. Uh, the problem is, what are we putting around the chocolate? And I think our responsibility is to take care about the healthness of our customer without losing gourmandise and emotion.
So it's, um, so it's got to taste great. I've heard that now twice, very important. But also, you spoke about the health of your customers, but also the health of the planet. The two are linked. Yes, of course. Uh, we, we, I heard about uh, rubbish. In, the, in our world of pastry, we have also to, to take care about that. And um, today we're speaking much more about um, season in the pastry. You know, uh, since uh, I'm 58 years old, um, always you're hearing, or you know, you have to do a raspberry, raspberry Christmas cake in uh, 24 December. <laughs> yeah, the customer is asking to you, but I think we don't have always to hear about the crazy customer because the customer is going to bring you the face on the wall. If we are following the way to give raspberry and strawberry in 24 December, we are on the, on the wrong way from our point of view. We don't have to hear always what the customer is waiting for. I think it's a totally a worth, a worth, yes, a worth way as chef. I think it's our responsibility to say, sorry, it's not possible. We have so many wonderful things around, <laughs> but 24 December in Europe, strawberry and uh, raspberry, it's impossible. Fabulous, absolutely great, great. Yeah, you can, you can applaud any time. <laughs> Chefs, we love applause. <laughs> no, I'm, speak, I'm speaking about Europe, I'm sorry, but we are in uh, Emirates here. Of course, uh, everything, if it's done by uh, Aquapony, if it's done by a uh, local firm, here, especially here, it's a funny place here because there is no season. This is why mm, better if it's growing from here, it's better coming from Australia, or I don't know where, but it's interesting to, to th understand that your point of view is changing if you're coming from uh, France, Egypt, from uh, here. Uh, we have to change sometime our point of view also. Yep. All right, Christine. I'm going to jump over to you because, um, you know, uh, Frederick mentioned on the, the right or wrong side of history where we're going. And, you know, for me personally, I've looked at competitions for a long time and, and kind of said, oh, this is not a sustainable practice. So I want to ask you about the video we just saw. Fill us in on that. And then, Anders, I'm going to ask you about waste specifically. But please, go ahead and give us the, the news. Yes, it's a competition. Uh, then the chefs make uh, three courses for four hours to, uh, to ten people and it's just uh, vegetarian food. And the smells good, the taste good and the chefs uh, love to work with us. That's the case. And the sponsor, this is really exciting. The sponsor loves to go with us on this competition because all the sponsors have uh, sustainability and food waste on their agenda. And we help them to uh, um, make their goals, to ask them, do you want to go with us on this competition? So I think this is uh, an opportunity to all chefs here around the world to make a sustainability competition. Maybe even at the World Chefs Congress, you mean? I hope so. <laughs> I hope Just so. saying? Yes. But um, <laughs> uh, you can see, you see on the video, all the participants, all the guests, everybody loves to stay there. It was amazing. So one quick follow-up. Was it, was it a hard, well, you know, for the competitors, obviously that represents a, a, a change of mindset, right? It's not about the piece of fish or the piece of meat. It's a little bit like you talked about, where the vegetables are. Was it hard for them to, to make that change? I don't think so. I don't think so. Because um, we have vegetables on all courses um, to the fish or to the meat. But you must uh, think, a little bit, um, think a little bit new. And chef is good. We are all good chefs. So we can fix it. I think so. Yes, we are. Thank you very much. It's really exciting. Um, Anders. Yeah, yeah, you can applaud. It's great. So, Anders, um, I want to, you know, we were talking a little bit earlier about one of my criticisms of culinary competition is when you see this, the amount of waste that's produced. 
you know, we're talking up here, we've talked a lot about plant-based already, but the point is, you know, there's more to sustainability than only plant-based. Important, but there are other parts. What about, can we get in competition things like looking at waste, looking at water usage, uh, energy usage, to really make it very comprehensive? Is that possible? Absolutely. Um, if we take, we had two competitions in Denmark. One was run by us, and one was run by another team. The other team had a 44 uh, container filled with food. We had uh, four trolleys. Just to set it in, in perspective, you have to think it in another way. You have to think it all the way through the chain from the farmer have the respect for his produce, then you will use less and smarter and better. And, but if you only think that it's going to talk about food waste, you're missing the point. You have to take the food and throw it away and think waste. Because waste is also water, electricity, and everything else you use in the kitchen. So we are planning on using devices uh, next time to monitor how we use electricity and water usage. You can do it already today. You can have it on your smartphone. You can see how much water you're using, how much electricity your oven is using. So why not use it in competitions as well? And so that could be part of the scoring? Um, hopefully. <laughs> <laughs> we haven't figured out how to do that yet. <laughs> but we, we hope to do that. Well, we're talking about kitchen KPIs. I think that would be a good one to put in there. We were also just discussing about could you like have the energy shut off after a certain amount? You got to get it in in time. But, but I think you have to think about food safety as well. <laughs> well, yeah. But these are these are brand new ways of thinking about competition. And we're going to come back to both of you because I think this is really exciting. Um, Rainier, um, question for you. You work obviously in the plant-based world extensively, and do you see a difference? between how plant-based is consumed uh, in people's homes versus how plant-based is consumed in restaurants? Is there a difference? It's a very good question. Um, I think what you saw is that um, the search in plant-based food with consumers has really taken off, let's say, two, three years ago. And that has a lot to do also with the uh, pandemic. So people started to cook and bake at home much, much, much more than ever before, with kids, etc. right? And at the same time, restaurants, hotels were shut down for two years. So when, it, when you take the last two, three years, yes, definitely, um, restaurants are just coming back, right? They're just in recovery mode. Uh, in some parts of the world, not even, right? Uh, so it's a very different stage when it comes to the consumers who really took two, three years ago, they took off in, uh, in plant-based food. So if you look at the penetration, the household penetration of plant-based alternatives for meat and dairy, which, by the way, have between 50 and 90% less uh, CO2 emissions compared to meat and dairy, yeah? it's significant. A cheeseburger with plant-based meat and cheese is 90% less um, uh, emission than a normal cheeseburger, 90%, 9-0, yeah. Uh, but if you look at the penetration in households in the US, for instance, it's more than half are using plant-based uh, uh, products compared to uh, meat and dairy, and only 14% of the restaurants are using plant-based dishes on their menu. So that's a big gap. It's three times less than what consumers are actually buying for in supermarkets. So and there's a big difference. And is it is it is it hard for chefs to ad adopt plant-based? I mean, do to cut, does it represent a change in their cooking? What's what? Why that 14 percent? Yeah. So I don't want to, uh, but I don't think it's easy. And I think uh, you already said it. Uh, how difficult is it to? I mean, how often are you experimenting with a new dish? That's what it is, right? You mm -hmm. just need to experiment with a new dish. It's actually your what you do every week. So I would urge everybody to just to try out uh, plant-based uh, dairy and plant-based meat and just experiment because, of course, you need to adjust to it. Of course, it may be a little bit different in terms of the heat, in terms of the melting, in terms of this, in terms of that. I mean, but that's all what creativity is about. 
but it's not difficult at all. And I think what is really important to understand is that the plant-based food of today is very different than the plant-based food a few years ago. Because a few years ago and now, the difference is dozens and dozens of billions of dollars of investment. There has been a huge capital influx in the development of plant-based food. And whether we like it or not, we have to follow the money. It's the same with the energy transition, what's happening now. If big investment firms start to change, that's when the tipping point is going to be reached. And that's why I'm convinced that there will be a tipping point in plant-based food sooner rather than later. Just one quote. Somebody, somebody predicted the end of dairy within 10 years. I don't believe that. I think it's going to be like 10, 12, 13 years, but it will be a very changing story. Yeah. So just to you know, bring us back to that question of macro question, why are we talking about plant-based so much? And you've answered that. The effects on climate on, as we saw in the last presentation of how much land it takes to produce all of this, it affects that. And, and plant-based is a, a great solution. But I know, Frank, you're dying to say something, and then I have a question for you. <laughs> no, no I, I want to say everything starts when you change thinking. You have to think vegetable first and so create a new recipe. And uh, then uh, if you want, you can put meat or fish within later on if you want. But when you create a plate from vegetable out, from plant-based ingredients, you have a, a plate who is ready without meat and, and, and fish. So that's, that's the way you have to go. And uh, uh, yeah, I think that uh, once you have this uh, logic way to work, it's easy. And but I that's not the way that most of us were, were, were brought up. Go ahead. I think that you have to stop thinking of how to have a vegetable look like meat. That's one of the big things in Denmark. Well, we have a plant-based steak. We have a plant-based burger. Why? Vegetables is lovely just as they are. Let them showcase themselves. Don't think about meat. Just put it on the plate and have a nice plate. Stop thinking as it should look like meat. I think it's a really good one because we keep thinking in meat. Oh, it needs to be exactly the same as meat. No, it doesn't. It can have another taste, right? You have different meats with different tastes. But just to add on that, um, I think I think what we don't need to ask chefs is to change their whole kitchen and change everything they do. Yes, we need to take steps, but one dish at a time, then you will start to grow the confidence and the creativity. Just change your cream. There are beautiful, uh, very performing, tasting, plant-based creams on the market, right? Just t try it, and that's, that's the start. All right, so great segue. Frank, question for you. Because, you, again, you work with so many restaurants, right, who are doing this. What holds restaurants back? What holds chefs back? Is it, is it fear? Is it the economic model that isn't working? Is it lack of education? What prevents, you know, <laughs> everybody in this room from going back to their restaurants tomorrow in the hotels and say, we need to do more plant-based? I think, Chris, it's all three. <laughs> uh, because... Uh, for, for some, they are really afraid that they will lose clients. Some others, they don't know how to do it. They never learned it because in the schools it was a classic uh, uh, base and, and so they don't know it. So we have to help them. Um, and yeah, that, 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 that is the thing. So I hope, I hope really that uh, I told it already that we stop this, uh, this idea that the client is not following us. Got it. Christine, let's jump back to competitions for a minute because it, you know, for all of you who have organized a competition, uh, it takes money and it takes sponsorship. Uh, and then you have to have people who want to do the competition to make it successful. How did that work out? Was, was the fact, you know, when you went to sponsors and said, hey, we're going to do a vegetable competition, 
Did you lose sponsors? Was it the same amount of sponsors? Were more sponsors interested? And the second sort of question is in terms of participants. Who was competing? Did it attract a younger subset of competitors? What was your experience? I can take the sponsor first. Uh, in the Nordic uh, Chef Association uh, is Norway, Sweden, Denmark, Finland, and Iceland. We have um, sponsors. Then uh, we uh, take the decision that we want to have um, a Nordic Green Chef. We ask two more sponsors. So we get two new sponsors who want to uh, go with us on this competition. They, they love to go with us because, as I said, they, want, they have sustainability and food waste on their agenda, and we help them to get goals. Um, the participants, it was uh, one chef and one young chef who work as a team in the competition. Oh, cool. Because uh, the recruitment is really important. So they learn um, um, from each other. Uh, the young chef was not the assistant. They were on the same line. They was um, um, uh, equals. Yes, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm sorry for the language, but um, they are. Um, so the competition was um, really, um, really good, and um, all the countries send uh, have uh, send the people from some from the from the um, culinary team. Some in Norway, we had a competition before, like uh, the Nordic Green Chef, and the winner there was going. And the Norwegian Green Chef, and the winner was going. And in Denmark, I think it was um, the culinary team uh, participant. So it was a high level. That's pretty amazing. I bet, I bet the young chefs were teaching a few things to the older chefs, maybe. Maybe. <laughs> the young chef is really good, and they, they think um, the other way and, uh, and us. I love it. So, Anders, quick follow-up question on that. Um, in terms of the competitions, you know, we, we've seen these, these, we're seeing these green competitions, vegetable-based competitions. Are there any barriers to this? To, you know, or is there any reason why you couldn't have a vegetable-based competition in Chile or in Singapore, maybe at the next World Chef Conference? Congress, just saying. Um, you know. Chris, I know you like short answers, so no. <laughs> <laughs> I told them all ahead of time, keep it short. <laughs> so there's really no so reason for it. There's no barrier. To, uh, why not? There should be a vegetable-based competition in Chile. I can't see anything. They have a lot of vegetables, so there's no problem in that. Singapore, it would work at like the World Chefs Congress? Of course. The, uh, well, I can't see the problem in that. <laughs> I really can. And I can also say that, uh, <laughs> for instance, when we talk about the Green Chef in Denmark, we, uh, the media was much more hyped about the Green Chef than the Nordic Chef competition. Oh, interesting. Because it was in the trend where everybody was talking about vegetable-based uh, produce and so on. So that was the novelty. Uh, we have uh, chef competitions all over the world. So that's, n that's nothing new in that. Let's do it. Vegetable based. That was new. Let's do it. And I think it will attract a lot more of sponsor in the future. The next time Christina is going out to talk about money, she'll find more. So I'm going to, Frederick, I'm going to jump over to you. Um, you published a new book, uh, which you're going to talk about in greater detail in a couple of days. So I don't want you to say too much about it so that everybody comes back to listen to you. But I guess. My, my question for you is, um, are there key learnings in that book that you can share with us that are action points, that are things that we need to be thinking about how we can do things differently? Maybe, you know, less is better. Just one of the example, uh, I repeat, I'm 58 years old. Not so old, but I am the old generation about pastry, I learned the custard cream with half and half milk and cream and 12, yolk, 12 egg yolks per liter, etc., etc. And it's, it's not so old. And in my book, I, worked, I did my book with a nutritionist, doctor, with uh, five engineers, agronomical engineers, and two chemists, 
Chinese people. And in my book, there is no custard cream done with egg yolks. Everything is just done with water and starch. And for example, it was a very big surprise for me. My friend in Genia said, Fred, why are you putting custard cream with a wonderful Varona chocolate Grand Cru, so wonderful, so expensive, why you put custard cream? And I say, because we always did like this <laughs> since 150 years. And he said, yes, but it's looking a very wrong idea because you have amazing product and you add some whipped cream, smell the cow, you mix some custard cream and they give me the idea, it was 10 years ago, try to change your custard cream for water and glutinous rice starch or potato starch. And you can believe me, it's amazing to see the difference of the chocolate texture, could be vanilla texture, could be pistachio texture, because finally the custard cream flavor is getting the custard cream flavor. Why do you have to add a custard cream flavor in a chocolate mousse or in a pistachio cream? And in my book, for example, all the custard cream are disappeared for starch with water or Provence, Provence from France, almond milk. And the result is amazing. About fat is very low, low, low fat. Is no without. Is lower fat, lower sugar. And I do just want to share with you, don't forget, in the pastry world and nutrition world, one gram fat equal two gram sugar. This is why if we have to speak about the first war that we have to do is not to kill, we don't have to kill the sugar, we have to reduce as we can the sugar without losing emotion. But before, we have to reduce drastically the percentage of fat of our job. And I worked a lot about this, and without losing never, gourmandise and emotion. I think this is our responsibility as chef. And if, if, if it can be uh, um, plant-based, it's a great solution. But I heard about, with this gentleman, about uh, cream, <laughs> plant-based cream. In France today, it's impossible to find a very good plant-based cream. I mean good for the planet because it's done with palm oil, hydrogené, hydro hydrogen, hydrogen. Uh, it means very bad for your health. And be careful, should be plant-based, but also very good for your health. It's not because it's plant-based that it's good for your health. Sometimes it's plant-based, but full of aromas. In France, there is cream plant-based with cream artificial aromas done with yeah. palm I, oil. I have to re respond on this, of you course. Can, you can, you can, you can <laughs> introduce know, me good I know product. what you mean. There are a lot of vegetable creams, cheap vegetable creams on the market. Uh, but the real, uh, let's say, last generation plant-based creams, they're free of any artificial, um, uh, uh, artificial additions, right? They're purely 100% natural, and that's really important. And of course, any oils should be sustainably sourced. That's one, right? Uh, and uh, will within two, three years, you probably will see it all uh, replaced with uh, coconut oil. Yeah. So, I, I, so really good point there. And the point was, and you brought it up before, and then I have one really fast question for you, and we're going to have to wrap it up, is that the world of sustainability is changing you had mentioned earlier how plant-based products are radically different today than they were three years ago. I guarantee you in three years from now, it's going to be a whole different place. But last question short, because Andy's giving me that look. Um, <laughs> just talk really quickly about what the menu of the future will look like. And you know, how are we going to change, influence the customer, and who will this customer be? Um, it's a good question. If you look at millennials and Gen Z people, right? So let's say people under the 40 years old, which are the core audience of your restaurants, I think they will be driving the demand now rather than the other way around. Uh, because more than 60% of these people are actively reducing, so seeking to reduce uh, meat and, and dairy. 
uh, and they don't find that yet in restaurants. So you will hopefully see the next few years uh, much more choices on menus for these people so that, let's say, if you are in a group with four, five, six people, and one of them is vegan, one of them has an allergen, one of them is plant-based, etc., that they all want to have the right choices. So either that group is going to choose to not to go out dinner, or they choose to go to a restaurant with at least the options, right? And that's where the turnover really is. It's these groups with a mix of demand. So yeah, I hope that restaurants are going to adopt to these uh, consumers. Another thing is, it just um, I think in the last meeting, climate labeling is going to be very important. So climate labeling is now being driven by the big catering companies like Sodexo and Compass, right? Uh, they have very clear ESG goals, so they are going to reduce uh, the, the emissions of their dinners. But I think in the next five years, like you will see now with calories, you will see climate labeling popping up or either be mandated by governments. Yeah. Thank you. So this is always the problem, right? We could spend hours up here listening to each of these panelists and Andy gave me the okay, we can stay for hours. <laughs> but I just wanna, two things real quickly before we get off stage. First is, please don't forget the video recording booth. Stop over, we wanna hear from you. We really want everybody in this room. Secondly, uh, if you wanna continue this conversation, I'm gonna have a, a breakout session this afternoon at 2.30 where we're gonna talk a lot more about Feed the Planet, about sustainability, what we're doing, and most importantly for all of you who please attend, it's gonna be a dialogue with you. We wanna hear about what you're doing and what we can do together. So, big round of applause for our esteemed panelists. Well done.